Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending this work. Sure, industry 4.0 optimizing industrial IT with IoT presented by Seme. I'm Kendra Peters, and I'm reading this far. Speak our STEM project manager of mobile at Seme, Erickson, head of advanced industries and Internet of Things at Erickson. Bob Regout, Project Manager of Connectivity at Atlas Copco, and Mobin Khan, AVP IoT Strategy and Product Management at AT&T Business Solutions. <clears throat> you can read their full bios on the right side of the window. Just a few technical notes before we begin. If you'd like to download the slide deck, please click the Resources List button at the bottom of your screen. The webcast is being streamed through your computer, so there is no dial-in number. For the best audio quality, please make sure your volume is up. You can find additional answers to some common technical issues located in the Help button at the bottom of your screen. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on demand within 24 hours after the event. We will follow the presentations with a Q&A session. Please ask questions. Q&A button on the left side of your screen. Okay, now let's begin. Sam, please go ahead. Thank you, Kendra, Kendra and thanks everyone for joining. Um, so I'm Sam from the GSME Mobile IoT team, and uh, our focus at the team is on LTE. Are you there, Sam? Uh, Yep, yeah, I'm here. So our focus at the mobile IoT team of the GSMA is on LTM and NBIoT technologies, which we collectively call mobile IoT. Um, so I'll be talking about the work the GSMA is doing on mobile IoT okay. and industrial. I think we're having trouble here. It's the same bucket speaker. Uh, so I'll be talking about the work the GSMA is doing on mobile IoT and industrial, but firstly I wanted to give you a quick overview of the GSMA in general. Um, so we represent the interests of over 750 mobile operators and 350 other mobile-centric companies right around the world. And you'll probably know us mostly from our Mobile World Congress events in Barcelona, Shanghai, and America. Um, so moving on to mobile IoT today. So a closer look. So the team here at the GSMA works with 56 operators on the two technologies, LTM and MBIoT. And to date, there's been... 70 commercial launches in 34 markets around the world. Um, we also work with 37 different vendors, and you can find the list of over 100 modules and 25 different development kits available for the technologies right on our website. Outside of the GSMA, we've also got an ecosystem community with over 1,100 companies, um, which I'll explain to you more about later on. So this slide gives us a good comprehensive overview of the 70 launches around the world and where they are. Um, as you can see, there's now there's not only um, are there LTN and NBOT launches, but also locations which have both technologies available. Uh, which I think is a growing trend, and I think we'll see more of that in the future. So um, this is also available on our website as a resource. So if you're interested to know where exactly the launches are, please take a look at this map online. Um, so at the GSMA, we've recently produced two documents on the use of mobile IoT within industrial. Um, this first paper 
how mobile IoT is changing the industrial landscape, talks about the benefits of using mobile IoT for industrial as well as mobile uh, multiple use cases from things like ta uh, toxic gas detection to predictive maintenance of tools. Um, so some of the benefits include scalability and flexibility as the wireless low power nature of the technologies allow the devices to be easily deployed in normally difficult locations. Um, and with the technologies being part of 5G, the longevity needed for industrial devices uh, is, is very much possible with these technologies. So that paper gives you a good overview of that and again is available on our website. Um, the second paper I just wanted to talk about quickly which we have produced with Ericsson shows real examples of how they have used mobile IoT in their factories in Sweden, Estonia and China um, to increase efficiency and flexibility. Some of the applications include tracking critical equipment, maintaining tools and monitoring stock. But Eric will also cover this later, so I won't go into too much detail right now. Um, but as I said, again, the papers are available from our website, so you can have a good look in detail as you wish. So as I mentioned, um, the GSMA has a community called the Mobile IoT Innovators, which is designed for anyone interested in using the technologies and is supported by the oper operators and vendors that work directly with us on them. Um, you can sign up at the link gsma.com slash MIOTI and you'll receive our newsletter and latest information to our events and invites to our events. So that's a really good way to kind of keep in touch with the latest launches, latest information and what's going on uh, in the ecosystem. Further from the community, if your company or someone already working with the technologies, you can apply to join our online directory. So this allows other companies to find you and you can have your own profile within our directory online. Um, if you'd like to be part of this, once you've signed up to the Innovators community, you'll be invited to join the directory so you just follow the instructions from there. Um, we will also often reach out to the companies within the community to help us demonstrate the latest devices and applications that use the both of the technologies. So it's a great way to have an opportunity to show what you're doing in the space. Uh, so now I'd like to hand over to Mobin Khan from AT&T who will give us a mobile operator's view of industrial IoT. Thanks. Thank you, Sam. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Um, so in the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to talk a little bit about our view of uh, what industrial IoT means from, uh, and, uh, from an AT&T's perspective and, or from a carrier's perspective in general, uh, but also try to give you um, a little bit about what are some of the problems in the industrial IoT world that we that we are facing with our customers. So the, with, with the next slide, um, uh, I was uh, you know, just introducing um, AT&T in, uh, innovating in IoT. We, you know, we, we today have about 44 million um, connected devices in the, um, in, in the, in the market, uh, and uh, they, they span all kinds of use cases, but predominantly you know, half of those are things on wheels whether it's cars, trucks, trailers, uh, and then the other half is all the other things. Interestingly, um, the industrial side of the, the, the world is, uh, is in a high growth area right now, and that uh, spans uh, all kinds of connected products, uh, some of the areas around the manufacturing floor, uh, as well as supply chain and logistics areas. Before I go into... Um, some of those details, I just wanted to touch on uh, the solution stack that uh, typically used in an industrial IoT setting. Um, so uh, if, if you uh, look at this next slide, um, we, we, we're talking about a platform 
uh, that is used to build solutions that includes a lot of different components. And many of those components come from partners and ecosystem, uh, for example, devices, service management, um, some of the analytics, data orchestration, cloud services, um, cybersecurity services around it. So it's a very complex undertaking to build a, a scalable, reliable, secure uh, IoT solution um, and to deploy that in a, um, a mission critical type of a scenario. Uh, one of the things uh, I was asked to touch upon uh, is to bring a carrier's or a network perspective uh, into um, uh, before I went into some of the solutioning aspects. So um, I wanted to just touch upon this, this ramp we have on the network side that started uh, from a, a 1G technology to now moving into 5G. Uh, and, and there's something peculiar that has happened. So when we went from 2G to 3G to 4G, basically it was about a faster, more data, a lower cost of data. But as we're moving from 4G to 5G, two things are happening. Uh, one is obviously we are increasing the speeds, we're lowering the latency it takes, the turnaround time for data to take. But we are also introducing these lower sp speed technologies, uh, technologies like LTEM uh, and narrowband IoT, which um, are not faster speed, but they address some of the other areas of uh, uh, requirements like battery life and costs uh, with, um, with, with, uh, with our customers. <clears throat> In addition, network today means more than uh, cellular network as well because many of the customers uh, are connecting their assets based on their environment. So, for example, if you are on an oil rig or in the middle of an ocean, you're probably using satellite. Uh, when you are on a land, uh, you may you be using uh, global cellular technologies. If you are uh, in, uh, in, in areas where you need uh, better penetration, like inside an elevator shaft, you may be using LTEM and narrowband IoT. And you may also have wired and short range, especially when it comes to um, uh, manufacturing uh, facilities and so on. So what I wanted to impart here was that um, uh, IoT doesn't mean cellular only. It means choosing the right technologies for the right customers. Uh, just wanting to drill down a little bit more into LTEM and narrowband IoT technologies a little bit. Uh, the key feature set, as I said, on these uh, low-power wide area networks is not about speed. It's about having better in-building coverage, more, think of it as more inches of concrete you can go through uh, to get the signal in. It's about having a battery life with a power saving mode that is much faster than we are used to on our mobile devices. So, you know, we... In, in certain conditions, we can think about battery life from five to 10 years. And then it's an, a network connectivity that's available truly nationwide along with the LTE network. So if you look at uh, the investments carriers are making that specifically AT&T is making around the globe, around the, the US market and Mexico, uh, you know, this technology now is available um, throughout the US and will, it continues to expand. Uh, and then followed by narrowband IoT in 2019. And what that means for customers is uh, you will you can now embed connectivity, IoT connectivity into uh, assets that you probably previously thought you couldn't uh, for cost or battery life uh, or penetration regions. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into this next slide in too much detail, but you know it really depends on your use case and your environment of what technology do you use? Do you use LTEM, narrowband IoT? Do you use uh, CAT1? Or do you use CAT4 in terms of what are you, you know, are you using high speed, low latency video? Uh, or are you using uh, a few uh, hundred kilobits a day to just read a meter? And, and depending on those, uh, you know, your use cases, you will choose different technologies, different cost points, and different uh, network uh, capabilities. 
Um, let's turn to the industrial area. So if you look at um, the verticals that are becoming very popular in terms of adopting IoT, I've listed a few here that, are, that we see quite a lot of growth in. But it, it, even in all of these uh, verticals, the, one that is, the two that are growing really fast uh, are retail and manufacturing, uh, at least from where I sit. Uh, I see retail and manufacturing um, uh, showing a very high level of growth in, in terms of adoption. Um, and then when you look at what areas in retail and manufacturing are growing, really you can think of this in three uh, chunks. One is uh, inbound and outbound logistics. So think about delivering goods or goods leaving the factory floor and how do you track them. Number two is around the, the factory and its processes. And number three is around the actual connected products that you're building. So let's look at the first one, inbound outbound logistics. It's really around uh, tracking of uh, your fleets and also of your goods. So think about uh, whether, whether you're shipping um, things on a pallet. If, you, if, I, if I was to uh, look at it from a size perspective, you know, it could be in containers that you could be tracking at a container level. It could be down to a pallet. Uh, the things that you're shipping or receiving, or it could be down to an actual package. Um, uh, and those could be in the back of a truck, or they could be in the back of um, uh, a, 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 a train and so on. So this fleet management solutions are really becoming key to a manufacturer and a retailer. And, and interestingly, it's not just in the enterprise space, but we're seeing strong traction also in the government space for that. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of uh, compliance that goes along with it. This is one of the highest areas of adoption today in the manufacturing industry. The second area is around connecting the actual product you're, uh, you're building. So think, uh, let's say you're building generators or coolers. Um, what you want is embed connectivity at the factory floor into those coolers or into those generators. You want to read the health of this cooler, you want to read how many times did the door open, is the temperature the right temperature. Again, depending on the asset, you may be reading different type of sensors. Uh, and what that allows you to do is to have an operation center inside of your, uh, uh, inside of your operations that allow you to provide better services or perhaps generate different sets of revenues uh, coming from that. And then the last thing I wanted to touch on was around the process itself on the factory floor. So this is, um, for example, we have launched a, a very simple use case with a, something called a button. So think about a button on the factory floor where uh, the, the foreman or the factory worker can now press a button to initiate a work process, a workflow. Uh, button could mean, hey, I'm down on inventory and I need to get inventory. Uh, or it could mean uh, there is uh, an, a, a, an issue at the floor and we need to shut down the assembly line for briefly. Um, so you could have these strategically placed buttons uh, around the factory floor or around your warehouses where you can initiate in the cloud processes uh, that could go into your CRM systems or ERP systems to, to start certain uh, uh, workflows. Um, so this is another area where we're starting to see uh, a lot of uh, traction. So again, summarizing industrial IoT, it's really about three areas of focus. Uh, one is on the factory floor, uh, like the processes with the buttons. The second is around the logistics uh, of delivery of uh, supply chain or outbound logistics. And thirdly, uh, it is around the actual product that you're shipping outside, embedding IoT in that product so you can monitor and service that product in a much better way. Uh, so that brings me to a uh, conclusion on my piece of it. I'll be happy to take on questions um, as we move along. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mobin. Um, and this is Bob Rigaus. I think the slides, if I'm not mistaken, is not the right one to look at yet, so I'll move on. Uh,
Okay, so I'm not sure what you guys are looking at, but I have a blank screen at the moment. Hi, Bob, it's Sam here. We've got the your starting slide on the screen, so I think you can begin. Yeah, because I have an uh, an error here on my screen and. Uh, so, okay, so uh, I'll uh, see without uh, any uh, any image if I can uh, handle it because I have a blank screen myself. So, hello everyone. Um, I'm Bob Rigaus. I work for Atlas Copco, and I'd like to share a few things on IoT uh, in our company. Um, if I press this button, uh, I'm not sure what you see, but I do get errors. Um, May have to call for assistance. If somebody can put it at the next slide, so the slide on. Um, uh, I, I've advanced the slides, Bob. So if you let me know, I'll I'll push them on for you. Okay. I think the the slide is called Alaskopco in figures, and then we start from there, and then uh, hope you can uh, guide me through this thing. Okay. So uh, just a few words on Alaskopco. So the two frame what company this is. So it's an, uh, a global industrial company with some 145 years of history. Uh, we provide compressed air, power flow, vacuum solutions, but also uh, power tools and assembly systems. And the figures here give you uh, some idea of the size of the company. So if we move on to the next one, then um, you see that we have a customer base, which is basically 100% business to business. So we have customers in basically any industry in the world, uh, like for instance in mining, civil engineering, textile, food, medical, and oil and gas, for instance. And now about compressor technique, that's a business area uh, within Atlas Copco uh, that then provides gas and process compressors, expanders, also air and gas treatment equipment and uh, air management systems. Now it's the service division here that basically looks after all this equipment that has initiated connecting all the equipment uh, to better manage and also develop our service business for all these installations. Okay, if we move then to the value of IoT, what, what is it uh, good for? So the IoT platform that we have built uh, provides value for internal and uh, internally and also externally for our customers. And I think it's very important to have that balance and have it, uh, a good balance there so that the IoT system doesn't serve only for yourself, not all, also not only for your customers, but there basically is a balance in, in between. Um, as you can see, we have uh, five regional diagnostics diagnostic centers uh, today, um, and these supervise basically our contracted installations. So here we uh, proactively work on avoiding disturbances with our customers and also detect potential efficiency gains uh, in these installations. Um, the IoT platform allows us also to be more efficient in our own sales and operations, and the data of the real world that we um, collect helps us also to build better machines. Now, for the customer, uh, we offer them basically a sticky experience with full transparency on what's, uh, how the installations perform and how we are performing on them, and, and also um, so they uh, basically for cost and risk reduction at their end. So we also provide them uh, through what we do with uh, less unplanned downtime uh, and energy efficiency management, and also we're working on our systems to guarantee the air quality or gas quality, basically the outcome of our installations. So, okay, uh, if we look on connecting machines, um, today we use uh, a module from Sierra Wireless to connect our machines, and we do that either with a loose gateway, um, for instance, also to allow us to retrofit installed equipment, uh, machines that are already in, in the field, let's say. Or um, now we're also integrating the module into our machine controller, and that gives us, uh, of course, uh, a more cost-efficient uh, uh, solution than, than a separate gateway. Um, then if you look at the rollout, uh, we have been uh, equipping uh, or connecting machines since uh, 2013 systematically. We did it also before, but uh, only systematically since 2013. And so we roll it out to more than 150,000 machines uh, today. And as you can see, the, the blue dots basically represent uh, machines. So we basically cover all industrial areas uh, around the world. 
Um, if we move to our production facilities for compressor technique at least, then you see that we have uh, uh, that we produce in a few regions. And now these uh, factories not necessarily ship regionally, but also uh, build machines that can basically go anywhere, as you saw in the previous slide. Now all this uh, gives us a number of challenges, and, and that brings us to the challenges slide, I guess. So um, the first thing that we need, or the first uh, challenge that we have, is uh, that we need a, a global solution, so also a single uh, SKU, because the factories actually share components and they ship to all continents. So uh, a machine can end up anywhere, and therefore a regional solution doesn't work with us. Uh, that would give us a, basically a logistic nightmare. So uh, a machine can be built in Europe and end up in China or in Brazil, but the machine in Brazil can just as well be produced in Brazil. So uh, there's no way for us to have different uh, modules that we um, use on a regional base. Uh, another challenge is uh, cost effectiveness. So every machine uh, is actually connected and that of course adds cost to each machine. But that doesn't necessarily mean that each machine also uh, contributes to the revenue. So we of course have a business case uh, behind it, but uh, we connect uh, more machines than, um, than yeah, not every machine is, is adding revenue for instance. So the hardware cost uh, must be cost effective. Uh, um, also needs to be uh, future proof, or let's say a future proof design so that we can, uh, with minor changes, uh, upgrade the technology to, um, to, to last longer. And of course also the data plan must be um, uh, cost effective in the sense that uh, all these machines that are connected are uh, sending data. Uh, and so of course uh, that's a recurring cost and then also that has to be efficient. And then we have a third challenge and that is the changing technology itself. So our machines last uh, easily 15 to 20 years and so they basically survive all this mobile technology. Uh, we're also fitting this uh, technology to machines that have never been built to, um, uh, to be connected in the first place. So we need uh, modules that, uh, with a fallback technology, let's say, and especially for our integrated modules, we need a strategy to bridge to the latest technology, as you see now with uh, 2G sunset and maybe already 3G sunsets in certain countries. Um, we must be able to, to follow that in an easy uh, way. And then uh, we move to the last slide. So uh, we look forward to go forward with uh, 4G um, narrowband. Uh, today we use a 3G solution with a 2G fallback, but we are actually are now preparing the next step, and, 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 and for us that's uh, 4G uh, narrowband. Um, now for reasons of security, also reliability, network coverage, and, and standards, we prefer the license spectrum over technologies like uh, Sigfox and and Laura. Now the challenge is again to build a global solution. So we believe to have found it by combining narrowband IoT and CAT-M in a single module and combine that with fallback to uh, 2G. Um, that offers a sufficient bandwidth for our application, but still allows us for, to do over-the-air software updates for our uh, module. Uh, it's cost-effective. Uh, it improves, and it's very important, the building penetration, uh, certainly uh, with the internal antennas that we now use, and, and most of our machines are ending up like in industrial buildings as often uh, metal or concrete construction, so we do have um, challenges on, on um, sensitivity of the antenna, so that will largely contribute. And uh, also interesting is, of course, the potential to look at new energy sensitive applications, and for instance, energy harvesting, uh, batteries in my, uh, in my opinion we will probably not use. Uh, I think there is a challenge. I haven't seen any battery that lasts 10 or 15 years, even if you don't charge it uh, uh, or don't load it. Um, now we have our first prototypes ready and are looking forward to sufficient network coverage. Uh, we have to wait a bit for that, I guess. And um, then we look forward to implementing it in our products. So that uh, basically concludes my um, presentation here. Thanks, Bob. Thank so we'll pass over to Eric from Ericsson now. Perfect. Hello, everyone. And this is Eric then from Ericsson, so it's easy to remember. 
we are very much in a, a perfect storm where 5G and Industry 4.0 is happening at the same time, which then the first step to really make this happen comes with narrowband IoT and LTM and then to the more critical applications to 5G. And for us, coming from the technology provider, we have heard from AT&T, the service provider, we have heard from Atlas Copco, which is the end enterprise or serving with the products. We are coming from the other angle, inventing then the different technologies behind it. For us, we see that this perfect storm is very much coming to place right now for industrial sites, which in 1850, everything was handcrafted and then full-blown full focus on mass production and fixed lines. And now we're back to full customization again with the help of digital. This boomerang is happening, which now in the production sites and the partners that we discussed with they are challenging and getting more and more sensors out and getting flexible and mobile in their production. So before where we think about industrial sites that they were fixed, that statement doesn't hold anymore. Now it's becoming mobile with AGVs, flexible production. And it's a variant explosion out there, so you have to become much more flexible. And that combination with Industry 4.0, where OT, IT, and communication players as us is merging, creates a very interesting combination where you have an OT player like Atlas Copco, an Ericsson and AT&T coming all three of us together and transforming and changing the digitalization journey for then customers. This is truly inspiring. We believe that 80% of all processes will be eliminated or reinvented by digital by 2020 with the help of this technology. So for the people on the call, what then is Ericsson? So Ericsson has 140 years experience of communication technologies. It's actually up in the last, let's say, 40 years that we have been doing the Gs, but inventing and pushing forward 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G with all the relevant components that are in there. And they have been primarily been focusing on consumers, getting our communication for individuals more and more advanced, and the whole explosion with data in 2010, with LT enabled. And now we see the type of network and plugins that we can do with LT, with the help of narrowband IoT and LTM, is very, very much going to the path of the next big transformation that is happening, which then, of course, since I'm in Ericsson, 5G. A big transformation, we're introducing new radio, combination of existing technologies, like and also introducing like network slicing and distributing cloud. And here, there you can, LT and Airband, LTM and Airband IoT is the path towards 5G for the massive deployments. And here, we're seeing 5G, more and more of these use cases go way beyond what we could imagine for humans. Now it's more about connecting the bigger machines and the robots. And I will explain to you why. Because the partners that we talk to, they get very intrigued by the potential of having a network that can serve both critical and massive. And from a massive point of view, the industrial sites soon and more and more get sprayed with sensors, talk to partners and they feel like they have, uh, the roof is about to fall down with the, all the different type of access technologies that they put in with RFID tags, Bluetooth beacons, LoRa network, uh, Wi-Fi access points, existing cabling, and it's getting tough. And if they can in the future now, with the help of cellular stepping into and have more uh, one common network that can serve both massive and critical, that would be extremely interesting. We looked into our own factories. We have production in Nanjing and in Tallinn and also in Stockholm. And uh, look at how many sensors are we about to be de de deployed. And it turned out that we will have one sensor per, per every second square meter. 
So we're going to spray our factories with sensors, and that's to be economically viable, but also penetrate and get the coverage going, uh, not just through one layer, but maybe two or three levels down in the basement, requires LTM or narrowband IoT. And the cool thing is that that is something that can be realized today. We saw, and it was already mentioned, a long battery life, bigger coverage. But the true value that we see in our factory is that we can then start to realize the dream of a digital twin or digital shadow of the, what is actually going on in the factory right now. But also predict what is about to go to happen and simulate the scenarios if we introduce new products. That is something that can be enabled when we have this mass deployment of sensors. And just to touch upon it regarding the critical side, here is where you get ultra low latency and very reliable communication. Partners that we discuss with and also in our own factories is like how can we move and dummy down the equipment and have as much as possible into the edge or the cloud. We stress test the network, and this is together with AT&T and others of our partners. But one of the latest one is that we got up to six, 26 gigabits per second. And uh, if you compare that to like a normal Wi-Fi back home, you might have around 100 megabits per second. This is so much bandwidth that uh, as a normal consumer, we don't really find strong use case for it. Uh, it's, or it's a little bit hard. But the industry partners that we talk to, when they hear what they potentially can do here, and with a very low latency, it's getting very intrigued uh, of truly now starting to cut cables. So the combination of LTM, LTM and narrowband IoT that we can deploy today, and the future potential starting with LTE and path towards 5G makes this very, very interesting for the industry sites. And everyone needs a very stable, secure, and simple communication. We have an explosion right now on the most massive amount of sensors that being deployed, but also an explosion on the different industrial IoT platforms, so industrial IoT application platforms. If you take Siemens, they have MindSphere, GE, Predix, ABB, ABB Ability, and the list goes on. And what we from Ericsson are doing is that we are deploying and enabling uh, through our service provider partners a network deployment that can be more connectivity in a box to support those quite rough environments into the industrial sites. We collaborate and gain as much insight as possible across the globe. We start with our own factories, uh, we, in that which I mentioned in Nanjing and uh, Shista, which is Stockholm, and Tallinn. The most uh, narrowband IoT deployments we have done is in uh, Nanjing. Here we have uh, done uh, everything from connecting screwdrivers coming from Atlas Copco, and uh, where we get the torque and the high calibration, calibration, calibration precision, uh, to connecting uh, critical equipment, monitoring environment, and environmental monitoring sensors, truly starting to spray the, the factories with sensors. And then we're testing a lot out in uh, Aachen and in Germany and see how far we can go with the network requirements. And we're on the journey, enabling industrial IT and truly set the foundation for 5G. We are in the cellular free industries type of setup right now with the late radio latencies, 100 to 50 milliseconds that is uh, deployable. Here we see the narrowband IoT and CATM1 type of uh, deployment primary in acid condition monitoring. We also have uh, augmented reality, AGVs uh, being enabled, and uh, some of the first initial positioning solutions. But we are this journey to cut cables, and uh, we believe that with the help of our combined technologies, we can see that we will reduce the amount of cables in the industrial sites from being around 96% today to, yes, an X number in a couple of years. And this is a truly exciting journey. And as a part of that, we have, as mentioned in the beginning of this call, uh, also documenting 
some of the key insights and learnings, which uh, specifically around our narrowband IoT deployment together with GSMA, and we are happy to share that report afterwards if that is of interest. Now you learn a little bit more about the journey that we do from an Ericsson point of view to gather the requirements and learnings for the industry so that we set the foundation for 5G to start today with the industrial IT. Thank you, Eric. That was really good. And thank you to the, our other speakers. So we'll go to our live Q&A now. We've been receiving some questions whilst the presentations have taken place. Um, and the first one, I'd like to invite uh, Mobin and Eric to answer. So it's a question on security. What are the security challenges for Industry 4.0? and how mobile IoT technologies help reduce these risks. So maybe Mobin uh, can take that first, and then if Eric, if you've got anything to add on top of that, please do after. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so this is Mobin. Yeah, security is uh, a, a top-of-mind issue for all of the IoT customers, and as you can imagine, there is uh, security threat vectors uh, across all uh, layers of the stack that I had put up, you know, whether it's at the device layer, uh, at the network layer, at the application layer, at the cloud layer. Um, and, and security is not, not something you address in one place. It's really a holistic view of the security that you need to address. So a couple of things that we do from a solutioning perspective. Uh, a, we, first off, we make sure that this, because this is enterprise data, this is closed data, we, this data never actually goes on open internet. None of the ports and none of the communication is open on the internet. It goes through our net bond or, or, or private network or, uh, you know, VPN services into our network and security deliver, securely delivered to the cloud services. Uh, over over private uh, connection, so so it, it's it's uh, secure from that point of view. Secondly, um, uh, any of the solution providers and definitely the network providers have continuous threat monitoring across the network and across the connections and devices on our networks, which means that uh, we continuously monitor um, things that are connected on our network and things uh, data that's passing through our network for any potential security. Um, uh, either breaches or, or compromising um, uh, attacks and so on, and we, we deal with that on an ongoing basis. That's sort of a uh, MO for, for, for us. So, um, and then on top of that, you know, d depending on the data and depending on the use case, the customers may deploy some added layers. So, for example, um, in government solutions, uh, they tend to be FedRAM compliant. Uh, you, you may need to add on some layers of encryption on the data and so on. So there are some added things that can be uh, put on top uh, in, uh, to, uh, to, to uh, address some additional uh, compliance or additional uh, uh, security needs. Thanks, Mavine. That's great. Um, I just wondered if Eric from Ericsson, do you have anything on security to add? No, I think uh, Mobin covered it very well. But as you know, from from the nature of the standardization of these networks, they are born highly secure and also going through license spectrum technology compared to if we step into like an unlicensed uh, type of setup, which it is with other access technologies it is born secure and that is a strong argument compared to other access technologies so i would just add that otherwise everything that mobin said was absolutely correct great thanks a lot um so we've had another question which is about the us um being 100 percent deployed with with NVOT, LTM, um, but there are other parts of the world still in the process of doing trials. So they're asking how they get visibility of those deployments. So the best thing I can recommend from a GSMA's perspective, we can answer this one, um, is to look at our website and find our deployment map. So 
the map um, at the slide that I showed during during my presentation at the start is available online and is live and is updated by us as new networks deploy. So if you go to gsma.com slash IoT, you'll be able to find that map. Um, and then, so if we move on to another question, so I'd like to ask a question to Bob from Atlas Copco. Um, so someone is asking Bob, do you use a classic removable SIM card or do you use an eSIM? Um, and does it have remote SIM provisioning? Um, and and also, does it use the GSMA standard? So if you can give us some overview of what type of SIM you use, Bob, that would be great. Um, yeah, I actually use uh, more than one. It's like this that in the in the um, um, the external module, so the uh, gateway that we use there, we have a plastic SIM, uh, a classic SIM basically. In our uh, embedded solution, we use a soldered SIM. I think that's temporary because we actually want to move to an eSIM. Uh, but uh, I'm not a specialist on this because uh, I would need uh, help from our engineering on it. Uh, but I believe that uh, at the moment we need the, at least a solder SIM um, for um, certification reasons in China, I believe. But um, if that's not correct, I think Nicolas can help me a bit on this one. Yeah, sure. So. So usage of embedded SIMs is uh, is uh, something that we support at Sierra Wireless. Um, the the technology there uh, it's not been used very much so far, to be honest. Uh, but uh, there is a clear demand from from customers, including Atlas Copco. Uh, and so as as um, um, as the technology is being deployed by both device makers, as we are and network operators, uh, it is becoming increasingly available. So, so there's a, a clear direction from the market to, to, to go more and more in this direction. Great. Thank you, Bob, and thanks, Nicholas, for helping out. Um, so we've got another question, I think a quick question probably for you, Mobin, which is, um, I think you covered slightly in your slides, but maybe you can just recover that. Are there plans to support NBIoT in the future, so for AT&T to support NBIoT? I believe you said yes next year. Yeah, that is, uh, that is correct. Uh, we have made an announcement uh, for NBIoT rollout in uh, Q2 of next year. Uh, for AT&T in the U.S. market. Great, thanks a lot. Um, so then a question to Eric from Ericsson, if you could answer this. So what what type of application do you think are the most beneficial? What ones have you seen in the Ericsson factories um, kind of give the most benefits from your point of view? Yeah, the one that if we refer now to mobile IoT, uh, the one that took best attention internally was when we started to connect all our screwdrivers and get the calibration on it. Uh, we started with a few. turned out that uh, we could improve and do predictive maintenance very fast, and we connected 1,000 screwdrivers. And uh, after just six months, we had ROI, and after one year, we had 210% ROI on that investment, just adding uh, narrowband IoT uh, sensoring on top to me measure the torque. So which means that in before we had everything on more manual maintenance, now we could do it to more predictive. Fairly basic and simple use case, but it turns out that it generated a lot of value. And now we just keep on adding then sensors in our factory in Nanjing. But I would say that that is the strongest one from a documented business value and return on investment. Great, thanks a lot. And another question for you, if you don't mind. Um, so there's been a question about what type of latency requirements are needed for industrial IoT. So I think you covered that mm -hmm. slightly in your slides um, when you talked about the differences between uh, kind of mobile IoT applications and critical applications. But maybe you can just talk about latency requirements for industrial IoT for us. Yeah, and of course, that all depends on the application. 
if we look at the more relaxed latency requirements, if you deploy a narrowband IoT sensor, then it may be okay that it doesn't have to be in full real time. Uh, but as soon as you start to go into real time type of applications and really move out intelligence towards the edge, we're talking around uh, yeah, 10 milliseconds, you can move up the task controller for a robot, but soon you need to move beyond below that and maybe more towards five milliseconds if you're going to take uh, uh, further components from the controller system in the PLC. Uh, and full end to end. Uh, control towards between the robots that requires even less than one millisecond. So it is a, a path here. I see that right now when we're around very relaxed latency requirements around 50 to 100 milliseconds as a condition monitoring type of use case is okay. Also to steer and control uh, an AGV is no problem with that and uh, uh, that is how I would see it today. Uh, but there is more and more stress on to get down uh, the latency. But important also to keep in mind is that we are coming from the radio infrastructure point of view. There is all the, also other components, especially the IT system that add uh, milliseconds and uh, the latency for, to get the full uh, circle of uh, communication. So um, uh, that has to be kept in mind depending on what you have actually deployed and how your IT system looks like. Great, thank you. Um, so I can ask maybe Mobin a question. Um, you talked, Mobin, about compliance within your presentation. Um, can you maybe give us a little bit of, of information about um, certification of products and how they would be certified for AT&T, how you would go about that? Yeah, so, so um, thanks. Yeah, c compliance, as I talked about, was slightly different, uh, but, but let me address uh, perhaps briefly both. So on the certification side, uh, we have a very well-defined process. It's available on our websites and everything on how to get your modules and your networks um, uh, onto the AT&T network and certified on the network, and there are two levels of those. Obviously, you have to get PTCRB, uh, certification for your devices, but in addition, AT&T goes through its own certification process. Um, and then we have a regular certification and a network optimized certification for devices that, for example, AT&T would be reselling and so on. Um, there's an additional level of scrutiny on that. Um, in terms of compliance, it's really industry dependent. Uh, you know, some of their devices could could be AT&T certified, but for example, they need to be uh, uh, in, in, in an oil and gas rig or they need to be in challenged environments so they need some sort of an IP certification in addition to an AT&T network uh, certification. So, if, for example, if you're deploying it in an oil rig, you need to be intrinsically safe and so on and so forth. So then you, you would go and get that industry uh, certification in addition to, uh, uh, to, to the AT&T network certification. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, that's great, thank you. Um, so a question for Bob. So with your advice from Atlas Copco, Bob, um, with your experience, sorry, what advice would you give another industrial company looking to connect their devices? I think you talked a bit about connecting legacy devices. Can you give us a little bit more explanation on that, please? Yeah, it of course uh, relates to what you want to achieve. Eh? So um, connecting new machines is uh, fairly easy, but um, if you have a business case that uh, relies on machines being connected, then we need uh, to connect the whole install base. In our case, we service or look after machines that are uh, either already with the customer or that are being added. But if we have a lifespan of 10, 15, 20 years of machines, we cannot wait all, until all these are replaced. Eh? So we need a solution that fits machines that actually were never built to be connected in the first place eh? and uh, that's what we uh, basically do so uh, with our as we're moving to an embedded solution in our controllers we still need um, a separate gateway for instance to uh, connect existing machines eh? also as a fallback um, mechanism of uh, we know already that the machines that we will connect uh, today or tomorrow uh, that technology that we build in will no longer be supported 
started in let's say five years time so then again for certain machines uh, we need to fall back to something else uh, so we will have an external solution as a backup all the time uh, that's one thing um, then second um, the internal battle with your engineering department probably these guys typically want everything all the time but that may not be what you need eh? so um, every let's say in engineering uh, a guy will typically want all the data in the machine real time and so on but there is no business case behind that so um, try to um, focus on what you really need and find a solution for that and in our case like I, I mentioned with the narrowband uh, IOT and so on um, that can that is good enough for what we for what we need basically eh? um, so don't exaggerate with the things that you really uh, that you want to implement uh, it has to be cost effective usable it has to have a business case in the end eh? Thanks, that's great, Bob. So I think then we've probably got time for one last question. Um, so staying with you, Bob, if you, if you don't mind. Um, if we're, we've had a question about reaching global connectivity. So I think you talked about deploying globally um, and using mm -hmm. both technologies for this. So can you tell us kind of how, how you do that? So, I mean, to reach that global scale? Well, um, uh, today we use uh, 3G and 2G, for instance, in our um, current uh, rollout. Huh? And, and those technologies we can uh, combine in one gateway or in one module that um, then fits, um, yeah, that, that, that uh, is, is giving us basically a global fit. That works basically anywhere. Huh? Um, but of course, we see now the 2G sunset and so on, so that's not going to uh, give us much more um, uh, capacity in the future, so we're um, going into this 4G narrowband, and, and there we see that uh, you have NBIoT coming up here and CATM there and so on. You see that uh, not uh, each of these technologies are supported everywhere, so that's an issue. Huh? When we first look at 4G at all, at all we, we saw more than 44 frequencies or something, so at that time we were looking at uh, still at separate modules regionally, and, and that's something that we can't control, so we, we need something that uh, fits uh, as a global fit. And so we uh, found a solution today that uh, combines uh, CATM or CATM1 plus a narrowband IoT in one module, but also adding uh, 2G fallback. If you then look at the world about, um, of, um, let's say, what uh, networks are available where, uh, then today we cannot use that yet because the, the, the 4G narrowband is not uh, rolled out sufficiently. Uh, we can hardly test it basically at this time. Um, but we expect that to roll out in the coming year or so. Eh? And as soon as that's ready, it looks like uh, with this combination that we uh, should be able to cover uh, all areas. Uh, but I'm still a bit scared that these uh, 4G um, networks might only ro roll out, let's say, in cities or something, and then it wouldn't work because a lot of industries, of course, are not uh, in the city centers, but just outside there, eh? so in remote areas. And, and that's where you find industry uh, quite often. So we need to make sure that uh, these networks are also rolled out over there. And then only we have, again, a, a global fit. Great. Thanks a lot. So I think that brings us to the end of our Q&A session. Uh, so thanks to all the speakers. And thank you, everyone, for attending this Fierce Markets webinar and submitting all your great questions. So. Uh, the webinar has been recorded and you'll be able to access the recording within 24 hours using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier today. So thank you again for joining and we'll look forward to seeing you at our future events. Thanks everyone.